uh, Maria will talk about the uh, Roman uh, dictatorship in Britain, um, Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra on stage and screen. Maria. Thank you. Um, oh, and I should say, I haven't got a watch on, Tim, so will you wave to me when I've got five minutes left and then I'll yeah. make sure I finish, because um, I very much appreciate the invitation to speak. I'm also aware it's a glorious day and we really should get onto the reception. I can see the glasses waiting for us at the end. So, so wave to me when I know um, I better finish. Um, so there are some interesting connections uh, with the preceding talks that, that I hope to address and I hope also, um, uh, fingers crossed, to get us to about 1976 in these discussions. But, uh, Sadly, not further than that. Um, oh, actually, I've got one thing that would take us into the 21st century. So that's good. Uh, what I want to talk about is Bernard Shaw's play, uh, Caesar and Cleopatra, that Federico mentioned that Gramsci had seen <laughs> in a performance in uh, 1919. So the play was written in uh, 1898, and it was first staged professionally in 1906. In Shaw's play, uh, the characterization of Julius Caesar and his interactions uh, with Cleopatra offer lessons in dictatorship. And here I'm using the term, I have to say, very loosely, <laughs> because he's not described as a dictator in the play, but his mode of leadership very much slots in, as we'll see, with these ideas of the late 19th and early 20th century of Caesar as representing a kind of Caesarism and a particular military monarchy. So that'll all um, hang together, I hope. So the play offers lessons in dictatorship, how to become a leader. It also offers lessons in what the function of history is and what counts as history. Um, what difference, Shaw is effectively asking, is there between a historical play and historical scholarship? what makes scholarship any better than a play as a way of engaging with the past. And how does history, and in this case we're talking about the dictatorship of Caesar, speak to the present and to the future? And it's that aspect that I particularly want to talk about, the ways in which Shaw is looking at a version of Caesar that he feels speaks to the present. And the other aspect of what I wanted to talk about was the way in which that particular characterization of Caesar, the lesson that Shaw wants his audiences to learn from attending the play, actually changes as the play is restaged. Because we are in different cultural contexts, we are in different political situations, audiences have different perspectives on what this Caesar is doing as the play is staged throughout the 20th century and ever since. So I'm exploring the play from a, a diachronic perspective across time rather than in its time when it first was performed and looking at various changes to the political significance of Caesar, not least because there comes a point at which people are seeing this play at the time and subsequent to the rise of European dictatorship. So I will um, look at the play's lessons in dictatorship and history in two key periods rather than lots and lots of different times of its performance. Uh, the first period I was interested in looking at is at the time roughly around its composition up to the various stagings in uh, up to 1912 because this is the period in which Caesar was routinely performed by the celebrated British actor uh, Forbes Robertson, for whom the part had been actually written. And I want to think about Shaw's construction of Caesar in this period, uh, 1898 through to 1912, to think about Shaw's Caesar as a new type of dictatorial leader, a leader that he sees as highly suited to the turn of the century. And the way that Shaw uses uh, anachronisms, for example, um, to ensure that audiences see how Caesar is useful to the present. And 
The other period um, I wanted to talk about, because I found this particularly interesting when I was looking at the, the history of the play's production, and I should just say that, that this is a current piece of research of mine, and I was never a proper Roman historian in my entire life. Um, I was only a literary person, and now I look at Roman history in its modern representations. So I welcome comment at the end. Um, the other period I wanted to look at was between 1945 and 1952. Uh, there are two key uh, moments for the play in this period. One is the film adaptation that was released in 45 with Claude Rains as Caesar. Has anyone seen that? Oh, only, what a surprise. Wow, that is a surprise. Uh, Vivian Lee is great. You, you should really watch it. Um, and also, and this you won't have seen, a celebrated staging of the play. Uh, it went on from 1951 right through to 52 in the United States, it moved to the United States, where Laurence Olivier played Caesar. And there is, you know, if you're interested in respects in which you can be a, a historian, um, it's amazing that there are gigantic, big um, scrapbooks in the British Library containing all the reviews of the period, letters from Olivier, letters to Olivier, letters about Vivian Lee, uh, letters about the production. It's the most rich kind of material for understanding this particular production, so quite exciting uh, to look at. And obviously in relation to these two productions, I just want to think a little bit about how understanding of the play changes when now it's being viewed at the end of a period of European dictatorship. Okay, so to start with this earlier period, and this is where I uh, reflect a little bit on uh, some of these issues about the rise of the conception of uh, Caesarism, Caesarism that Federico was uh, talking about, and have a brief mention of Momsen with a less cute picture, I think, than, than Tim had of him. Um, so, sure, um, one of the things Shaw was doing with this play was interrogating the concept of history. He um, really wanted um, audiences to appreciate that a play can offer you historical analysis and in ways in which he felt were sometimes more engaging, uh, dare I say, than historical scholarship. Uh, so he actually is deliberately challenging the discipline of history and the work of professional historians and that's why he subtitles his play a history right so this is a history not a play in that sense okay. he claimed in the published version of the play uh, that it was a chapter of Momsen uh, and the quote is on the screen uh, a chapter of Momsen and a page of Plutarch furnished with scenery and dialogue and that a boy because in those days it was only boys that a boy brought to see the play could pass an examination next day on the Alexandrian expedition without losing a mark. I think most of the historians here would say that's not entirely true, but <laughs> it sounds good. And more provocatively, perhaps, in an interview given to a literary magazine at the time of his play's composition, Shaw said, history is only a dramatization of events. And if I start telling lies about Caesar, it's a hundred to one that they will be the same lies that other people, i.e. historians, have um, told about him. Okay. So for sure, historical fact is only intelligible through narrative, whether it's written narrative in scholarship or performed narrative. But he also thinks invention is justifiable to reach a higher historical truth, and this is where he departs perhaps from most reputable uh, scholars. Um, so, for example, in his Act One of his play, where Caesar arrives in Egypt, uh, he has an invented scene where he meets Cleopatra at a Sphinx, which I'll come back to. How many of you have actually seen a performance of Caesar and Cleopatra? Shores. So, yeah, whoa, how sad, right? It's also a very interesting play. Um, so, Shaw argued. And this again, uh, I think it was Federico who mentioned that uh, Gramsci saw 
Shaw Caesar was utterly different from Shakespeare's Caesar, and this was something that Shaw was consciously trying to achieve. Right? Shaw argued that Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and through Shakespeare, going back to Shakespeare's source Plutarch, was a reduction to absurdity of the real person. Uh, and here you see the kind of staging that was taking place of, of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar at the time that Shaw was writing his play. They were huge, elaborate performances, and somewhere in there is the body of Caesar being shown. This is the um, friends, Romans, and countrymen moment of um, Shakespeare's play. Okay. So Shaw explicitly attacked Shakespeare's treatment of the dictator in the preface to his uh, collection of three plays that Caesar and Cleopatra is part of. And he says, Shakespeare, who knew human weakness so well, never knew human strength of the Caesarian type, note Caesarian, uh, being used in this late 19th century sense. His Caesar is an admitted failure. And Shaw has no truck with a failed Caesar, and certainly not with a dead one either. So Shaw... Uh, chose, you know, an interesting question is why does he do a play about Caesar and Cleopatra? Shaw chose Caesar's Alexandrian War as the pivot for his play rather than the more well-known assassination, uh, effectively to privilege his own play over that of Shakespeare. Right? So it's fundamental when you're writing a play about uh, Caesar in the British tradition that you have to respond to the great canon of Shakespeare. So what he's doing is setting it temporarily earlier so that his play can become somehow prior to that of Shakespeare's. Right? Hence I've made a bigger image of the play here <laughs> than little old Shakespeare over there. Okay, so, um, so he then uh, is challenging the primacy of Shakespeare's Caesar in the British cultural context, the self-glorifying Caesar, the aged Caesar, uh, the Caesar who needs to be um, assassinated. Not so attractive picture, I don't think, of um, our Monson there. Um, Shaw rejected Shakespeare's Caesar uh, and, the, and the common Anglo-Saxon estimate of Caesar as a usurping tyrant. Um, he, uh, the source for his positive reevaluation of the dictator lay fundamentally in Mommsen's uh, History of Rome. Uh, the eighth edition uh, was published in English translation in 1894, so that's just four years before the composition of Caesar and Cleopatra. And again, if you go to the British Library, you can find um, Shaw's notes, his marginalia, his writings, his summaries that he made of the text of Mommsen that he had read. Um, the German historian, as I'm sure you all know, uh, interpreted the end of the Roman Republic in vividly modern terms of 19th century political life. So he's already brought Roman history into a kind of present circumstance. And he uh, presented Julius Caesar uh, from a position of explicit partisanship as the great reformer of an outmoded oligarchic constitution. So in his famous uh, fifth volume, famous uh, to me because that's the one Caesar's in, uh, is where he talks about the establishment of a military monarchy. Right? Mommsen had praised Caesar as the entire and perfect man, and as a monarch never seized with the giddiness of the tyrant. He is perhaps the only one among the mighty ones of the earth who in great matters and little never acted according to inclination or caprice, but always without exception, according to his duty as a ruler. Okay, so this is where what I want to do is to offer you a little snippet of Caesar's soliloquy, the first time we see Caesar in Shaw's play. And I have to, uh, obviously I can't show you the performance from 18, from 1906, so I have chosen, because it was accessible, a clip from a 1976 television version of the play in which Alec Guinness is playing Caesar. Caesar uh, expresses in, in 
almost mystical terms, a sense of his loneliness, his isolation from ordinary mankind, his otherworldliness. And the dramatist here makes this Caesar utilize elevated language. Caesar speaks a kind of prose poem uh, intoned in delicate uh, musical rhythms. So Caesar, uh, Shaw's quasi-mystical Caesar is one suited to um, the turn of the century, right? So you have to imagine that was what Caesar was saying on stage back in 1906 and on into 1912. Uh, Caesar has outgrown conventional political and ethical codes. He embodies the evolution of man into a new superhuman being, right? He's part man, part woman, part God. It's a kind of more restrained version of Nietzsche's Superman, and he bears some similarities to the world historical individual articulated in Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history. Um, this present-day Caesar speaks in a number of ways to his immediate British context, right? So imagine we're there in uh, the, 19, the early 1900s. It's a, a speaking to a British context that was recognised in a recent performance, so this is as recent as we get in 2002. But here's a performance of the play that was done in modern dress, because it was recognised that Shaw was using the Roman past to talk about the British present. So now this is the British present um, made more explicit. Um, there are jarring verbal anachronisms in the play, but you would be foolish to think Shaw doesn't know that Romans never said peace with honor or Egypt for the Egyptians. He is quite deliberately and provocatively using political slogans of the late 19th century in order to make his Caesar intersect with current political concerns, particularly ones about uh, British national identity and about British empire. Uh, a new prologue was provided to the play in 1912 and it was spoken by an Egyptian god and he directly speaks to the audience and tells them they are like Caesar's contemporaries in essentials so they cannot protest when the figures of the past share modern political slogans because we, the audience of Shaw, are just like the ancient Romans. That is the point he's wanting to make. And the character of Caesar's secretary, Britannus, who you can see here on the far uh, right, um, is uh, presented as a, a comic a version of a British civil servant. Uh, one who is narrow-minded and sanctimonious because Shaw is criticising a kind of sacred version of British imperial culture. And of course, one of the uh, clever aspects of this play is that in the historical time frame of the play, uh, Britannus comes from the savage periphery of a much more enlightened empire, and he is constantly reminded of that through the course of the play. So what then about the lessons for dictatorship um, that um, occur within the play? Uh, Shaw's play um, focuses heavily on Caesar's desire to teach Cleopatra how to rule. And Caesar here embodies humanity at its highest development and Cleopatra humanity at its base development. That's perhaps why Shaw has used Cleopatra here. Uh, across the first three acts, we are invited to watch her slowly learning the lessons of leadership um, and then throwing those lessons away when she secretly orders the murder of uh, the guardian of her brother, Ptolemy. Um, and at this high point of Shaw's play, when Cleopatra has failed to learn the lessons of leadership he has been teaching her, he says, if one man in all the world can be found now or forever to know that you did wrong, that man will, either, will have either to conquer the world as I have or be crucified by it. And so to the end of history, murder shall breed murder, always in the name of right, honour and peace, until the gods are tired of blood and create a race that can understand. And again, this, this speech is marked 
by uh, the elevation of its expression, by its diction and its rhythm as a significant revelation of Caesar's understanding that he has failed to teach Cleopatra. Um, it is also the case that uh, Cleopatra is used as a comic foil to Caesar in the play and she regularly recognises, deflates his pompous declarations of this kind. Uh, she uh, points out to him when she meets him at the Sphinx that actually this is only a little pet Sphinx <laughs> and there are many Sphinxes in Egypt and that completely undercuts his whole mystical do you understand me Sphinx speech that he's just made. And when she dresses him for war she notices that he's bald and that he is vain and that's why he wears uh, a laurel wreath. So there is some undercutting of this heroic Caesar going on through the course of the play. He's not always completely heroic. Um, at the close of the play, uh, and I'm sorry this is this is taken from the archive so it's not the best image, at the close of the play Caesar abandons Cleopatra and the fallen world of Egypt, the world that cannot understand him, and he goes back to his death in Rome. Cleopatra is, is completely un unconcerned about the future of her country and aspires only to romance with the next Roman who's due to come any minute now, and then she can enter into Shakespeare's play. Um, so, it's quite clear here that the play as a whole invites us to appreciate that Cleopatra has poor judgment. She's got poor judgment that she thinks Mark Antony is a better man than Julius Caesar. And it's also clear that um, what Shaw is doing is suggesting that although Caesar fails to teach that lesson, Shaw may succeed in teaching that lesson to his audience. That Shaw can do what Caesar has not done and teach, um, teach his audience the importance of having such a figure as a um, leader. That the audience can become the race that can understand. How am I doing for time? Five minutes. Five minutes, great, because this is where I get on to the what happens next. Right. So I'm just going to talk about this um, briefly. So this is Shaw taking on this role of wanting to teach his audience why such a Caesar is needed now. Okay. So Shaw insists that um, art should be produced for the sake of society, that the past is not separate from the present, it's a perspective on the present. It can teach us about our future. So I want to think about what happens to the kind of lesson he's teaching or trying to teach when you watch Caesar and Cleopatra in its later manifestations. So one problem with this play is that in the 1920s we have the emergence of dictatorships in Europe and the rise of Soviet socialism. Uh, Shaw imagined a new world order was emerging that would fit with his utopian visions. He praised Mussolini in the British press in 1927. He visited the Soviet Union in 1931 and he was supportive of Hitler right up until 1941. Now such political thinking inevitably contract, uh, uh, um, attracted considerable public attention and controversy, as in the headline, Shaw heaps praise upon the dictators, that is not a positive comment about him. Okay. So, added to the fact that Shaw praises dictators is, as Federico was mentioning, Mussolini closely associates himself to the point of identification with Julius Caesar. It's also the case that a hugely celebrated performance of Shakespeare's um, Julius Caesar, uh, put on by Orson Welles in New York in 1937, staged it in modern dress to use Caesar as an image of a dictator, a dictator who um, destroys society, who um, traps uh, people into uh, believing in uh, demagoguery and wanting another dictator to replace him when he dies. That's the lesson of uh, Wells's play. So it's no surprise that critics started to see um, Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra as um, to, to see Shaw's Caesar as an example of one of those despot heroes, one of those European dictators, and therefore to feel very uncomfortable about the kind of Caesar who was being presented on the stage. 
So we have a huge criticism of the British film that was made. Uh, interestingly, and given where we are at the moment, uh, the film was uh, begun six days before the Normandy landing, which we are due to um, mem um, celebrate and remember uh, next week. Right, so the film started production in London in 1944, six days before the Normandy landing, took 18 months to make and cost £1.3 million in its day. Right? That did not go down well, uh, as you can imagine, for the sheer expense at a time of rocket attacks and wartime austerity, let alone the fact that in the play, uh, now turned into a film, you seem to have a celebration of a dictator. And particularly because of Shaw's uh, support for socialism, you find consistently right-wing condemnation of this film um, as a duping British uh, filmgoers. So Bernard Shaw, among the innocents, is being exalted by all these duped members of the public, not appreciating the unpatriotic things that are emerging from his film. Um, his Caesar... Uh, the right-wing uh, critics uh, said, was a cold-blooded, war-weary philosopher, not the great soldier and generous administration, administrator that he really had been. Same thing happens in the United States when the film is released there. Here's a review from the men's magazine Esquire. I'm not sure Esquire has ever been mentioned before at the Roman Society, <laughs> but here it comes. In 1898, it was dashing and provocative for the shocking intellectual to suggest in Caesar and Cleopatra that dictatorship was the ideal form of government. Hitler had, has shown us that two political fools in Parliament or Congress acting as checkmates on each other are a lot safer than one fool armed with absolute power. Yet after the shambles dictators have made of the world, Shaw is right back where he was in 1898. Uh, Shaw is still arguing for Caesarism and dictatorial power. He must have observed that dictatorships don't end well. So you can see with hindsight, the reviewer is strongly critical of Shaw's political theories. Um, so, just very finally, for the last couple of minutes, I just want to mention the play. Okay, so the play was revived by Laurence Olivier just a few years later in the early 1950s. Interesting, as part of the post-war festival of Britain. So therefore there was a sort of patri patriotic dimension to the production, and it was paired with Caesar's Antony and Cleopatra. So one night, Antony and Cleopatra was performed, another night, Caesar and Cleopatra. Uh, in both plays, uh, Olivier with his wife, uh, Vivian Lee. Um, and it's interesting that the, the notices in the British press said that, that Olivier was clearly playing um, Shaw's Caesar, perhaps differently than Shaw had intended, giving him a terrifying edge playing him as, the, uh, as if the cosh of dictatorship was always up his sleeve. So Olivier is deliberately creating a very different kind of play by virtue of playing uh, Caesar uh, more clearly as a disturbing dark dictator. Okay. So what I want to finish with is what happens with this, um, what, what the, what the uh, film and the stage play do to get away from the difficult messages that seem to lurk in Bernard Shaw's play. And what they do is they shift focus onto Cleopatra. So when the film is released in the United States, right, there's Cleopatra in the middle, but there's Julius Caesar just stuck in the margins, right? And what is this film about? The most seductive beauty the world has ever seen. So forget lessons in dictatorship here. Okay. Uh, finally, and interestingly, because they were staging Shaw one night and Shakespeare the next night, the production managers utilised a Sphinx scene in both plays. So Cleopatra meets Caesar at the Sphinx, same Sphinx for where she um, produces a great tragic speech over the death of Antony. What then happens is audiences see these plays, one night one and one night the other, as a biography of Cleopatra, not as anything specifically to do 
with Caesar. Um, and so um, you end up seeing that, for example, in these sorts of images, you find the mature Cleopatra looking rather patronizingly at the younger girlish Cleopatra who had been in Shaw's play. So Shakespeare gets to win over Shaw in the end. So what I just wanted to finish by saying is that this single reception of a Roman dictatorship is clearly quite complex and also very malleable. It changes over time because political systems and ways that we look at the um, model that Roman dictatorship is offering us is changing over time. Uh, and it just shows us how rich the tapestry of the reception of Roman dictatorship um, has been and will continue to be, we imagine, in the future. Thank you very much. Oh, you go to the mic. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Federico, please. Yes, thank you very much, I mean, to both speakers. Um, I think um, what occurs to me is, is uh, a whole series of, of contrasts between Caesarism as it's um, presented um, in, in general uh, political thought and the sort of Caesarism that Gramsci is looking at and the kind of Caesarism that the critics of Shaw see, and maybe uh, the real Caesar. I mean, the first person who would uh, say that would be Monson. Um, and I just wonder if, if there's a, a reaction to this um, in the sense that what we haven't mentioned at all today is the fact that uh, Caesar was, of course, assassinated and what came after him was his uh, adopted son Augustus, who in a way reacts against Caesar's enlightened worldview, and maybe goes back onto a, um, a more uh, narrow nationalistic sort of Italian view. And I just wondered if, if uh, Federico would like to comment on that. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be monopolising this. <laughs> um, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, I think I should ask. Uh, for questions, and then we can get Federico and uh, uh, get get this uh, get get responses. So, um, are there any any questions from the floor to start with? I hate to bring the focus purely back to Cleopatra, but I, I wondered um, how other plays concerning Antony, Cleopatra, etc., um, fit into the spectrum that's set out here between Shakespeare and Shaw. I'm thinking particularly of um, All for Love, which is, uh, I forget who's by Sheridan. Is it Sheridan? Um, and I, I, I wondered about your thoughts on, on that and its historicity. Um, well, it's a, it's a very long and complicated and rich tradition for Cleopatra. Um, and you could really look at each of the plays in which she appears um, related to its circumstances of production. And there has been a lot of work done on that sort of thing. And not just plays, but also, uh, for example, ballets. Um, so from the 19th century, there are a whole series of um, ballet productions of Cleopatra that emerge. And there, you, it's not just a question of what kind of opposition she's offering to the Romans, but it all starts to get interconnected with ideas of Orientalism and uh, female sexuality. Uh, and so if you were looking at the tradition of Cleopatra, one of the things you would look at is not just the political authority of women in the world and how that affects play productions, uh, but also ideas of gender and sexuality have huge effects on what kind of Cleopatra is um, represented, how she's played, and how audiences respond to her.
perhaps I, I should ask Federico if he'd like to comment on the yeah on, on the point you made earlier. Yes, um, Gatcha shows strikingly little interest in all that stuff. Um, and uh, uh, of course, while, while he was writing those notes that, that by millinery was forthcoming but not quite there yet. Um, he, he does mention Augustus a couple of times, but to, to him, really, the turning point is, is, uh, is Caesar. Um, Romieu, on, on the other hand, uh, one actually comes up with the notion of Caesar, um, is much more interested in, uh, uh, in Augustus than in Caesar, because Augustus, whatever one might have made of him and his grand plan, did not fail. But as a, in many respects, Caesar can be regarded someone who did fail, or, or who didn't quite achieve uh, what he had planned out. Um, and, and so, you know, since he's interested in, uh, Romeo is interested in defining Caesar as a, as a, as a paradigm that will, uh, that, that works and will work in the long term, Augustus is a much more viable uh, part of this. Um, there is, I suppose, a general caveat uh, that I briefly made in, in, in my talk, which I'm Worth restating, um, the notebooks are very much, the, as you would say, you know, the first century to speak, the, the stumps, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the preliminary notes of, of, of a much of a much bigger project in which, no doubt, uh, the triangular period or the Julia Claudian yeah. age would have found um, much more thorough discussion in the notes of this book. Could I add something to that? Please, which yes. is just the um, interestingly, under um, Mussolini, he did actually shift from identifying with Julius Caesar to identifying with Augustus, not least because Caesar does have the rather unfortunate example of not lasting very long and being killed by his friends. Um, but, but also because, and perhaps ironically given what Gramsci says, is because Augustus is perceived as the founder of empire in a way that Julius Caesar simply isn't. And, it's as if the regime is waiting to declare Italian empire in order to then be able to say that Augustus is the model now, not, um, not Julius Caesar. There's a striking omission, not, sorry, there's a striking omission, not just in the notebooks, but also in that uh, brilliant review that I uh, mentioned, the, the, the review of, of, of that production of Shul. Um, Gramsci never addresses the issue of uh, uh, clemency. Of Caesar's clemency, which of course is so prominent in uh, even in Shaw's play, um, and which I guess, if one is interested in the whole problem of how you go about uh, negotiating your way through 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 an after the war period, um, so establishing a, a regime in the long term, is not a, it's not a trifling matter. But 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 it's not something that he that prefers at all. And and one could speculate on reasons for that, which might have been very real, especially in the 1930s. Uh, again, he would have caught wind of what, what was going on in Moscow, but then the whole issue of uh, uh, clemency in that context. Uh, thank you for your uh, expansion on Caesarism. You mentioned that uh, Napoleon would have been viewed as a progressive Caesar. Could you, in, in Gramsci's terms, could you um, elaborate on the difference between Caesarism and Bonapartism? Yes. Um, he does not really resort, in the quaderni, as far as I can see, to Bonapartism as an, as an analytical category, because he is interested in uh, uh, identifying the, 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 the <coughs> long-term dynamics, I suppose, of the interplay between the political and the military uh, dimensions uh, in what people would call 25 years later the long durée. And as far as he's concerned, Bonapartism gives him too narrow a, a time frame to, to, to work and think with. Um, on the other hand, uh, he, he regards Napoleon I as someone who has struck perhaps less effectively than Caesar, but nonetheless quite felicitously. Uh, and, uh, a balance between uh, political power and, 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 and military power. So, in, in, albeit in a very different historical context, he is uh, he, he's happy to he's prepared to look at uh, Napoleon the First under the same rubric as Caesar. With Napoleon the Third, of course, 
there is a um, also a problem of periodization kicking in. Um, 1848 and more generally uh, the Industrial Revolution, and you know he is very explicit uh, in identifying the Industrial Revolution as a moment that quite simply changes the ways in which you um, go about uh, pursuing a Caesarist project. Uh, whereas, while well, before the Industrial Revolution, you do need the military to get involved. After the Industrial Revolution, and Napoleon III is the first example, in his view, uh, there are a number of options um, at your own disposal. Um, and you, know, you might resort to military options, but that is no longer the necessary precondition of war. So, like, as ever, when you talk about Bonapartism, of course, there are, I suppose, two different constructions of Bonapartism that, that you could construct now there. The first and the second and the third. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is very, very tangential to what we're talking about, but um, Caesar actually plays a part in the Second World War in the Battle of Britain because uh, Hitler wanted to draw Mussolini into the campaign against Britain in 1940, and so an Italian Air Force unit was draw drawn up to near Calais and in was involved in bombing attacks, even on places like Canterbury. Uh, and the and the, there's an Italian magazine, which I forget the, the title of now, uh, where there's um, an account of the Italians um, uh, glorifying this small operation as being connected with... Uh, the the re-invasion of Britain following on from Caesar. <laughs> the, the, the aircraft, the, there's one aircraft from this group has was recovered, which crash-landed, and is in the Hendon Air, Air Museum. That's where, that's where I got this information from. And then a, a few years ago, by pure, pure chance, there was a, an aeronautical magazine produced which had a long article all about this, with all the details of the pilots and, uh, and their exploits and the types of aircraft. I would love to see that. I mean, of course, invoking Caesar in that connection is a <coughs> questionable operation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Claudius would have been a much safer. <laughs> yes. But not so glamorous. Yeah. No, no, no. But I think also, um, speaking of, of nationalistic approaches to this, um, uh, Napoleon III, of course, uh, was conflicted because uh, he's also trying to stress the Gallic ancestry of, of, of France and uh, the heroism of Vercingetorix, with whom, <laughs> if Mussolini identified himself with Caesar and Augustus, um, Napoleon III identified himself, uh, more than anyone, with Vercingetorix. Indeed. Indeed. Are there any more questions or observations? I can see the drinks welcoming us. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think um, what I should do is without any further ado is to thank our two speakers for uh, this session, and at least one of the speakers of the previous session, um, for the entertainment they've given us. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.